Okay. See. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for coming out on, uh, is this the first day of spring or something? Is it? No. Nah, no. whatever. <laughs> it feels like it though, right? Okay. All right. Because Margo brought it from San Francisco, from the Bay Area, whatever. So thank you so much for doing that for us. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's wonderful to have a, I'm not going to say old friend, but a good friend uh, here on the, on the right coast as we, <laughs> we joke about it. Um, we are really going to have a good time today. Margot has been having a good time since she's been here. People, as you know, who know her work and know about her and understand the kind of things that she's been trying to do her entire life are also happy to have her here with us. Uh, she describes herself, or she's been described as a transnational feminist, activist, and educator whose work examines issues of militarism, armed conflict, economic globalization, and violence against women. She was a founding member of the historic Combahee River Collective, a Boston-based radical black lesbian feminist, anti-imperialist, and socialist organization widely known for the Combahee River Collective Statement, a revolutionary political text that served as a theoretical blueprint, blueprint to what we know today as intersectionality. And I wrote a lot of other stuff here that I'm not gonna read, and I'll tell you why, because I'm gonna tell you what I know about Margot. I met Margot in Washington, D.C. in 19, and when we were working <laughs> on this, there was a, a, a very uh, nasty kind of uh, set of actions taking place between um, newer Korean immigrants and the African-American community. And we were asked to come in and to do sessions with those communities to talk about what kinds of things could possibly happen to lessen those tensions. So that's where I was introduced to her practice, to her work, uh, to how dedicated she was to what she thought was the importance of progressive uh, work around these issues and as a guide for us being able to learn how to become uh, allies. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we kept running to each other over the years, so I guess we had to be friends. So I appreciate that opportunity and I appreciated that opportunity to learn from her. But we also wanted her to have uh, a conversation today with two other people who I have tremendous respect for and um, have come to uh, know as friends. I don't know what they think about me, but they're my friends. <laughs> but uh, I love, again, uh, the kind of work that they do. And for folks who are familiar with the Stone Center, you know that these are the kind of people that we like to have in these halls and in these walls. On my right is uh, Professor Heidi Kim, who's a professor of English and Comp Lit here and director of the Asian American Center, the inaugural, the first, the number one, numero uno, director of the Asian American Center here. Her research and teaching ranges through 19th and 21st century American literature. Currently, she is writing a comprehensive cultural history of the Japanese American incarceration during World War II. She has also published on Walt Whitman and anti-slavery literature. Um, I've already mentioned that she leads the uh, Asian American Center. And for those of you who've been watching what's been going on there in its first year, it's done a lot more in its first year than many other centers and institutes have done over the past five years. And I think that's uh, a credit to people like myself who championed her being a director. <laughs> what? Other people wanted it. I wanted her. So what can I say? I mean, we. <laughs> Let's put it like this, the, the community brought us, the community brought us the best person, yeah. and we were fortunate to have the sense enough to hire her. So I'm so glad she's here. On my far right is Tanya Shields, who is an associate professor and director of <laughs> undergraduate studies for women's and gender studies. Her research focuses on Caribbean studies and plantation logics. 
She is the author of Bodies and Bones, Feminist Rehearsal and Imagining Caribbean Belonging and editor of The Legacy of Eric Williams, Into the Post-Colonial Moment, which examines the contributions of Eric Williams, the first prime minister of independent Trinidad and Tobago. She is also currently serving as director of Carolina Seminars. I think what you have represented here are people who have absolutely figured out how you stretch a 24 hour day into 28 hours because they are working from the moment, I swear, I, I, I don't know how they do it. It's something about youth. I don't know how you guys maintain whatever it is, but it is absolutely remarkable. The level of work, the depth of work and the seriousness with which they take this enterprise. And as we can see around this campus now, it's very difficult to keep good people here. So hopefully you all will help make sure that they don't get away from here. Please welcome everybody here today. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here as well. We're gonna let everything go on and then we'll take questions from the audience, but we'll also be trying to integrate some questions from uh, folks that are watching online as well. Yeah, you can put it in your pocket. Just don't take it. <laughs> well, you've got to watch me. I might take it. <laughs> I'm gonna put this yeah, little, little thing right here. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. So, Margo, we're so delighted to have you here, and I think especially because we you're visiting a lot of classes while you're here. We have a lot of students who are here. And we wanted to start off by asking you what your first encounter was with theories and ideas about feminism. Do you remember? Was there a first text or a first personal experience? My first personal experience was being in a mixed race, transnational family. My mother's Japanese. My father is African American, and we lived in Japan until I was 10. I was born in 1949. So my father was part of the occupation forces. We came to the States in 1960, and I didn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't have used these words then, but that's when I really saw intersectionality at work, right? The class difference between my parents, the racial difference, the category of nation and all of us coming here and you know she having and his family were in Rockford Illinois so we had to travel from California driving across the country and she had to get the motel rooms and it was already shaky for her because remember the Japanese Americans had been interned right so seeing all these different kinds of intersections i didn't know i didn't understand it I'm, I'm understanding it and being able to talk about it now, but it was that lived experience. Isn't that a funny concept though? How are you gonna have an experience if you're not living it? But anyway, <laughs> that's the jargon. Um, you know, that experience of seeing all these different things, even as we're going across, you know, driving across from uh, California to Illinois and just kind of watching and being curious, like, where am I? You know, I'm in America. I didn't know anything more than it was America, but I saw these various things, you know, happening around gender politics, race politics, class politics, right? Um, and so my first text was that experience very early on, you know, and then of course later, um, the Combahee River Collective, the uh, Boston Women's Liberation movements, you know, that were in place. Um, and to be honest, back then we didn't have texts, right? We read novels. Mm -hmm. Those were the texts, mm -hmm. right? The, that was Black women's studies, yeah. Yeah. right? There were no theoretical books about, you know, anything, right? But we read the works and through those works, we understood about life as Black women, right? As whatever class was being talked about, you know, in the bluest eye or whatever, right? And so 
Black women literature was so foundational to us as Combahee River Collective folks, but I think to Black women in general. Right? It wasn't really until I guess maybe Beverly Guy Sheftall or, you know, um, she's one of the founders of Black Women's Studies, right? Um, the, the book about, you know, the words of fire, right? And um, uh, some of the women are, some of the men, the black men, you know what I mean, brave, but some yeah, of us are brave. brave. <laughs> That's Patricia part, Bell yeah. Scott, Barbara yeah. Smith, Gloria Hall, right? Yeah. So that was later, that was later in the 80s, right? So in the 70s, we didn't have that. We had the novels, which were absolutely important. So I would say that. I mean, as an English professor, I couldn't be happier with that answer. <laughs> So you mentioned the bluest eye. Were there other novels that you specifically remember having that that deep impact? Oof, now you're asking me to remember. <laughs> like that was 45 years ago. No, um, for sure, Toni Morrison's work, Alice Walker's work, Nella Larson. You know, um, and of course, um, this is a moment. Their eyes were watching God. You know, was really those were really important. And they were also important because they were also about the South. Hmm. Now that I'm here, you know, in North Carolina, as goes the South, goes the country, right? They say. Um, and that was really important because we were all in the North, even though our families may have come from the South to the North. But, you know, hearing those stories, most of those were set in some place in the South, right? Mm -hmm. And so just thinking about that was really important. I'm curious, were there any Asian American writers who were entering into that conversation at that point? Not in the beginning. Not in yeah, not in the beginning. But I mean, later, especially with Bridge Called My Back, which is just an amazing collection. Um, and they just celebrated their 40th anniversary. I don't know if you all attended the event. Um, but, you know, people like um, uh, Mitsue Yamada, Merle Wu, of course, you know, um, Janice Mary Katani, the poets, you know, um, they were really important, but they weren't on the scene at that moment in the, in the early 70s that I know of. They may have been, and that's the other thing I think it's really important is so much of the history of movements of the country get told from the east side of the continent. I think if we started the story from the West side, which was actually colonized before, right, with the Spaniards, we would have a different, we would have a more complete story about race, about class, about nation. Because if you start from the East, you forget about Asians, for example, you forget about Latinos, right? You, you, you end up with just a, a black, white, that is African American, uh, Middle Passage, African American, and white colon colonizer paradigm. But if you start from the West Side, right, of things, then you can include other important people's histories, and especially also Indigenous peoples. You know, who often just get left out of the, the story. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this wasn't one of our questions, but just given the conversation, I'm curious. So how did you all read the novels? So you read these novels. And so what was the, was it just like a reading group as we might imagine it today? Or what was your conversation like around what you were reading? So the, the, the novel that I remember the most in a sense was Sula, because it was about a woman who just kind of pushed the boundaries, right? And that's what we were doing even though we were not trying to make history. Yeah. You know, we didn't write anything or do anything because we thought 45 years from now, y'all gonna be talking about us or thinking that what we did, you know, was important. Um, at least for me and some of our conversations, it's like Sula was a badass, <laughs> you know, she really pushed it and she was outcast in some, you know, many ways, as you all know, um, but we, we love that. Right, because we were crossing borders and crossing boundaries and being outlaws in a particular way, as she, right? Um, and also for me, one of the, the most important 
pieces was the Song of Solomon because it was about transformation. You know, people can fly. Right. Right. You know, that last page, you know, when she talks about somebody flying, it's, it's amazing, right? And so I think what those novels did was also, it, it was a combination of critique uh, and the politics of what I think about as politics of possibility. Ah, I love that. So what are you reading now? Nothing. <laughs> okay. As long as YouTube videos. I know. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, what I'm doing now is really learning about music. Ah, so something, a really fun thing I'm doing, I told um, Professor Jordan about this, is um, I'm DJing a transnational feminist dance party every Thursday what? for the last two whole years. We're into our third year. It starts at 11. <laughs> It starts at 11 o'clock on West Coast time. We have people from California, Kentucky, New York, Washington, DC. So that's three time zones or two time zones, right? Kentucky, same as each. And then we go to Central European time because we have people in Europe, certain part of Europe. And then uh, we go to uh, 9 p.m., 11 a.m., 9 p.m., we have people in Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Palestine. Wow. So <laughs> how do we we've been, in? we've been dancing every week, except for a few weeks we've taken time off. Myself and um, now I'm co-DJing with uh, my uh, uh, DJ feminista, she calls herself, um, a young Chinese American woman. So we have this intergenerational DJing thing going. So every Wednesday, I send out or Tiffany sends out an email that says, okay, tomorrow's our dance day. This is a the theme, you know, um, and, and this Thursday it'll be International Women's Day, of course. Um, send us your favorite songs. You know, people send different songs. We have this amazing list of like 400 and something songs from those almost, we're going into our third year. And what was important about that is it was a way that we could be together across time zones, right? Um, across geographies, across generations. It's really this intergeneration. We have little baby Omar from Palestine who comes with his mom, right? Um, we have me, my generation, and Gabi from Switzerland who's in her 80s, right? So and then the ages in between. And what's, what's amazing about that is the ways in which we don't really talk, we don't analyze anything. We just see each other on Zoom, we're dancing together. You don't have to turn on your camera. You don't you know, have to do anything. Just show up as you are and listen. And dance. And dance, or not, right? And it's been this amazing space of joy, of being connected, because it started during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. April of 2020, and we've been going at it. You know, if you want to um, be invited, as the young people say, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be hip. No, well, you're better than I me. Know. I think I've given up. <laughs> so how how does this? I mean, this that's an amazing thought, right? All of these people dancing together across these time zones how for does, three, almost going into the third year. Years. Yeah. How does that? kind of, you know, international solidarity in that sense resonate for you with international movements of protest, you know, the kinds of bigger movements that you've been involved with all mm -hmm. your career, right? Because this is this is a, a celebratory thing, right? A fun thing, but then how does it yeah. how does it sit for you in conversation with the political protest, right? The mm -hmm. anti militarist work. So um, this sounds too much like Harry Reasoner and Q and A or something, but anyway, I'm just kidding. They don't know. No, no, <laughs> that's true. Sorry, <laughs> David Frost. No, um, Oprah. Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think 
what I've come to learn over the years is that so the, the strongest movements are movements in which we have deep relationships with one another, right? And most of our movements are about, okay, what are we doing? What's the strategy? What's the analysis? You know, what's the tactic? Assuming that if you have the correct analysis, you, you, you have the, you'll be able to come up with the correct methods. And if you have those two, then you'll be able to create change. Well, we know that that's actually not that true. Right, so we can come up with certain kinds of change. And we see this now, especially, right, when there are some progressive organizations imploding because, you know, uh, we, we, we haven't created the kind of deep relationships we ought to have with one another, right? Um, and that we can't just be against something. Like we have to organize ourselves against principles and values that we want to say collectively, this is what we're agreeing to, right? As well as this is what we're trying to create. It can't just be against the oppressor. And June Jordan said that in her report from the Bahamas, right? She said, you know, getting together, uh, uh, fighting a common oppressor is as predictable as the weather. That is, it's not, you know, because she says, once you get, um, the monkey off your back, then everybody is going to scatter in whatever direction. So I think for me, I've come to, to realize that the foundation of any movement has to be on around, at least around two things. One is building sturdy relationships with one another. That means going through hard stuff together, you know, um, being honest saying, I don't know, you know, saying, I'm sorry, um, saying, you know, I want to learn, you know, can you teach me like all those things that make us vulnerable, right? Um, and that, and that I think we have to do the work we do because we love life, right? And we love being alive, you know, we want to thrive, all of us, right? Not just that we're trying to transform an institution, because the other question I've been asking whenever I'm giving talks and you know in many places is who do we have to become in order to live in or to be in places that we've created that are utopian or even close to it? Because think of all the radical progressive organizations, think of you know, the um, decolonized states where the people have ended up recreating the same nonsense that they spent their whole lives changing, right? So how do we think about movements that are both personally transformative and structurally transformative, right? And they're not separate, they're not parallel projects, mm -hmm. right? They actually go together and how do we need to envision the methodologies that will enable us to do both simultaneously or in relation to each other? Does that make sense? Yeah, and it actually brings me to a couple of the questions I had. One is about intersectionality and how that theory has developed, but I'll come to that second. Because I think what you're saying takes me, you've talked a lot about love and love as an analytic and love is actually in the Kumbahi statement and I've you know, read interviews where you talk about it, some of your writings, you talk about it. So would you tell us more about, because I think that building relations with people um, to build movements is in a way about love, like loving people. So what does that mean to you? You know, it's not romantic love, but it's, it's or is oh, there's it? Some what, what is it? Yeah, there's some of that. Yeah, there's some of that. No, I'm just there kidding. should be some of that. Yeah. <laughs> we can't leave that out. No, no. Right. Yeah, but no, in, in the context I'm talking about is, um, To me, love is a commitment to actually recognizing and acknowledging others, right? To, to, to really seeing each other and acknowledging, recognizing right, one another, to saying that love to me 
is a is a radical value in that it is about affirming life. Right? It is about affirming our humanity, right? It is about dealing with the forces that have dehumanized all of us in various ways that have deformed us, that has mal-shaped us, you know, in various ways, right? And for me, love is both a connection, like a heart-spirit connection to each other, but not just like, okay, you know, let's just hold hands and be together, but let's hold hands and be together, deal with the contradictions, deal with the tensions, deal with the conflicts so that we can use that force, the new learnings that come from that to create the places that we wanna create, right? It's not just so that we can all feel good about each other. That's important, absolutely. But I think it's also an aid of trying to ensure that everybody and the planet is thriving ultimately, right? And this is a really difficult moment, isn't it? Oh, yeah. For so many people in the world. Right. Yeah. And and Ukraine, however horrible it is, you know, is one example, right? It's the most current example. But as my um, uh, sister friends in Okinawa talked about in our project, where we're dealing with US military contamination, you know, um, Suzio Takasato said, the US military has been killing us slowly for the last 70 plus years through the military contamination, just for example, right? And so how do we take the connections we have with one another, both to feel good and take care of each other, but really in aid of creating something where everybody can thrive and the planet can thrive? Oh. Oh, it's not getting through? Yeah. Oops. All right. So, you know, we could just step back and take off our masks. Okay. I don't even know. Oh, there we go. I hear I'm in the back. I'm in the vulnerable age. I know. I know. That's why we wanted to respect <laughs> I can No, 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 don't go. Don't go. Okay. But I also, I, I think a lot of students have engaged with the Kumbahi statement and, um, you know, want to be what they call intersectional feminist, and that's really critical to them. But I know you've talked about the, um, you know, to really do intersectionality, you have to pull in class, race, and all these other things, but it can't be reduced to multiple identities. I think one, one time you said you detest that idea yeah. of uh, intersectionality being reduced to just multiple identities. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about what you all were doing um, when that statement was written, what was important for you all to analyze, and how you've seen the theory change over time and what you think of it now? Mm -hmm. Um, that's very hairy reasoner, I know. <laughs> that is very hairy reasoner, but it's okay. Um, you know, I think I want you all to, um, and as one member of the Combahee River Collective, one of the founders, and other folks in it may say something different. So I just want to put that disclaimer in there, is how we talked about it and how I'm understanding it more and more, especially since it has been reduced to multiple identities is to understand intersectionality, you have to understand power, right? You have to understand institutional arrangements, right? Structural inequalities, structural power, right? And the ways that those are made manifest as they affect different groups of people, right? And that, for me, intersectionality isn't just a theory of oppression, right? Or frameworks to understand oppression. It's also helps us understand privilege, right? So I can't just say, oh, I'm a woman of color and, you know, I have to think about class right, and what kind of privilege that gives me as a middle class woman, right? Some might say I'm upper middle class or whatever, right? But I have certain privileges. So it's, it's in disingenuous, I think, to only look, use that to understand oppression at the individual level, 
right? That to, to, to really honor the complexity of our lives, it is both, you know, for many of us, especially people in this room, it is both about advantage and disadvantage. So that's one thing. And thinking about how that's connected to the institutional structural arrangements in the wider society, and that those change over time. They're not static, <clears throat> right? What's static is that oppression exists, right? But different groups are affected differently, you know, based on certain historic events, right? So, to th you know, 9-11, right? I mean, think about what happened to our Arab or Arab looking or Muslim looking folks, right? And some of us were right in there saying, yeah, get those Muslims. Do you know what I mean? Get those Arabs, right? And so I really invite you all to think about um, our relationship, the, 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 the importance of understanding power in the, that understanding of intersectionality. You know, I think that's really important. Another part of that is we implied it, but we didn't really explicitly talk about the category of nation as an important analytic. And for us in this room, what it means to be connected to the US state and US corporations. Right. Do you think really that the killing of black folks would have been publicized in the way it has traveled in the way it has if it had happened in an African country? I don't think so. Right. Part of it is the power of the US media, you know, the influence of social movements because we're connected to the US state and the kind of global influence of the state, right? It worked on our, in our, in our, um, or for our side, right? In, in so far as publicizing it, but we have to recognize that, right? And most of us have no idea what the US military is doing to other people of color in different parts of the world, people of color, right? Um, or what the US corporation, the kinds of impacts the US corporations are having in different parts of the world and how the US corporations and the military are working together, right? They're two sides of the same coin having devastating impacts we, because we don't need to know about it, right? That's what it means to be in a dominant group. We don't need to know about what's happening to the subordinates. Does this make sense? You know, and so even as um, a quote, people of color in the US, I think we have to take seriously our relationship to the US. Even if we say I'm a good American, and I've said it, right? We're good Americans, we're concerned Americans. Yeah, that's true. And we still have to think about what are our accountabilities and responsibilities being connected to the US nation state and the US corporations and what are our responsibilities, right? And in these transnational settings, there's an enormous amount of power by being English speaking, by being connected, having a blue passport, we can go to so many places, right? We can go travel to different countries, you know, there's conference. Um, and so how do we take that, those things into account when we're sitting in a room and, you know, a lot of the conference is done in English. You know, who among people in other countries, what are the class implications of people who can speak English fluently enough to participate in the conference? Like these are these things I've learned, you know, over the years being in these different um, situations, right, where, where I've been. I don't know if that answers. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, you know, the relationship of the individual um, and the responsibility that the individual has to take for being part of a state, right? A powerful state, an aggressive state, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. I think about it a lot for my own work with reparations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even with current events, yesterday I was reading uh, Boris Johnson's op ed in the New York Times about Ukraine, right? And he was so careful in his. Uh, op-ed to talk about, you know, the Russian people and the great Russian culture 
as separate from the government and the state, and of course, mm -hmm. um, but how do we navigate then, right, that responsibility that we bear? Because so many people, I think, do want to disclaim responsibility or feel, you know, very detached from our political system, very disenfranchised, mm -hmm. right, um, by specific things, you know, in the U.S., um, the election system, right, or people abroad in totalitarian states. How do, how do we navigate thinking about that? Because I think that is a really central problem right now. Mm -hmm. It is, and you know, embedded in, in what you're saying is there's also another fundamental question is what should be our, our relationship to the state, yes. right? And um, what can it be? What should it be? What should it not be, right? And how can we even think about sort of dismantling state apparatuses in some ways? Right? Can we be much more globalist or international in the ways we think about governance, for example, right? And and think about the well-being of people. Um, I think to answer your question more directly, you know, as um, Sweet Honey sang and June Jordan wrote, we're the ones we've been waiting for. We're the ones who have to play a part in stopping the war so that things can have that people can be given aid, right? As long as the war is raging, not much is going to happen, right? So one thing I've been thinking a lot about is how do we actually understand that even though it's, we're differentially situated, that ultimately we share a common destiny, right? How do we actually really get it? Um, And that old chant, you know, if um, uh, none of us are free until all of us are free is so true. And if you don't see it now, I don't know when you're going to see it. Right? I think this COVID uh, syndemic has really helped us, if you were looking, if you're interested, to see those connections. Right? Um, and we have to be part of movement building. Because I think, and, and a movement that's, you know, um, global. So you had said um, that you have called yourself a good American. What does that mean to you? I said that about myself, but, you know, good American meaning, you know, I'm progressive and I'm against the U.S. military and, you know, um, I'm for real democracy, all those things, those values, right? And all those things are true, right? It's like white people saying, but I'm a good white person. You know, and you may be, and I may be a good American. Nonetheless, I'm not off the hook for doing things to hold this state accountable for things that they're doing in Korea or they're doing in Okinawa or Palestine. The occupation of Palestine would not be possible without US support of all kinds, ideological, military, da, da, da. You know what I mean? And so like it's, as I said in the class earlier, it's a both and moment where we recognize that we are connected and we're opposing the state at the same time and state policies. Right. So you've talked a lot about nation as one of these um, components of analysis that we mm -hmm. really need. And you, and I think in Jacob Cross, uh, they read a piece by you about sort of um, when you, you came into that understanding when you had the Fulbright in Korea. So can you talk us through that a little bit? Because one of the things that I have found impressive about you, I mean, just you, of course. But... Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Flatter you will get you everywhere. No, I'm just kidding. But it's also your willingness to grow, you know, and be challenged over the course of your life. So if you can talk a little bit of both how you came to understanding nation as a critical analytic, mm -hmm. and then also how do you stay open you know, how do you stay, I guess, curious is the other way to think about it. Because I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here we go. I know, I know. Um, well, you know, that moment in um, South Korea was really a very important turning point. So I'll just take a quick few quick minutes to explain that. 
So around that, um, that time, early 90s, and Joseph mentioned our work in DC, there were all these tensions and conflicts between Korean immigrant merchants in African-American communities and African-American community members. And I also wanna invoke Marshall Wong, who was really an important part of that at that time. Um, and, you know, there was the Latasha Harlan killing in LA, there was a big Apple boycott in New York, you know, all kinds of stuff. I was curious, like, is it possible that Korean people learned that once they arrived in the US? I mean, I could imagine they learned something when they arrived here, but I couldn't believe that they didn't know some stereotypical things about Black Americans before they arrived. So I wrote the Fulbright grant and my question was, what did uh, Korean people in Korea learn about African-Americans? That was my question, right? The curiosity had to do with what was happening in that moment. So, um, you know, doo -doo -doo, I'm going on Fulbright, yay. Um, I got there and, um, you know, I was a little bit lost because I don't speak Korean at all at the time. Um, I don't speak it very much now. Um, and just kind of wandering around and I, I was really lost. I'm like, where the heck am I? I had no idea, except there was some familiarity um, because of some closeness around the um, US and Japanese cultures and all of that. But anyway, um, I, I remember, you know, being able to relate to um, older Korean people because they spoke Japanese and because I spoke because I speak Japanese, so I could communicate with them. And of course that meant that I learned about Japanese colonization of, of Korea, right? And then I'm standing in the middle of Seoul and there was a big army base, Yongsan army base, right in the capital of the country. And I'm seeing all these US army guys and, you know, um, and I'm thinking, like, where am I, you know? And in that moment, understanding what imperialism is and kind of the impacts of colonization, longer term, you know, the older Japanese people, uh, Korean people, you know, speaking Japanese and all of that and thinking, oh, crumbs, you know, it's not just that I'm a woman of color, but here I am connected to Japanese imperial power because my mother's Japanese, that's where I was born, right? And the um, US you know, power in Korea as an occupying force as some people see it, some people don't, right? Depending on your political perspective. And I'm thinking, I had no idea actually of either of those things and especially the kind of influence they had over time. And the other thing was, I was in a telephone booth trying to make a call and somebody, Korean person taps on the, um, the glass because there were they didn't, no cell phones back then. Um, Are you Filipina? <laughs> and I said, no. And that was when the women from the Philippines were just being brought in to um, serve in the sex industry around the US basis, right? Or they were coming in as domestic workers. Right, and so here I am in this moment, like all these things converging and thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I can't just claim disenfranchisement and marginality, but I really have to look at the structural power that I had. Also, I was on a Fulbright, I had a passport, I could go to the demilitarized zone where Korean people could not go. Right, I had entree into places because of my passport and my class, which was related obviously to the Fulbright, right? And so I couldn't just claim woman of color, black woman, you know, and I'm on the margins. Like in that sense, I could just come and go, you know, do things, people assume things about me, but also the intersectionality part of it is people would not think I was affiliated with um, so university, right? Because I'm brown, right? I'm black. So are you with the military? Uh, no, 
right? But do you know what I mean? That's intersectionality. So an important part of intersectionality, I think, is thinking about power and context. Because it's the context that kind of illuminates a particular part of your the category you embody, right? And yeah. We've been talking to you for oh, yeah, about 45 so like minutes. This, yeah, this is and we do want to open it up. Sorry. To, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, so oh, um, no. there's a question on really that I'm sure some of you oh now. on the thing, not you. Um, <laughs> So if you have questions, you know, start raising your hand and we'll, I'll come around to, um, okay, I see someone. I'll come around and get you, but do you want to ask that question? Yeah. This is a question about the concept of a lived experience and a thing that what advice do you have for college students looking forward to teaching, especially at social media and the I don't understand the first part of the question. Increasingly virtual world. Mm. Like it's virtual, but we're still with people. I mean, do you know, even virtually, you're still, you know, relating to people. I mean, I was kind of being facetious, you know, with this idea of lived experience. It's like, uh, how can you not be living your experience? But anyway, um, I guess, you know, what's important about experience is that it's not good enough just simply to have an experience or have series of experiences, but how do we put ourselves in situations where we have to reflect on our experiences and not just through our own eyes, because we could be delusional. You know, we could just be in a little circle, just spinning our own story, our own narratives about ourselves in relation to the master narrative but not stories in relation to other people, right? So one of the questions I think, why these kinds of spaces are important, you know, whether it's the new building that you all have or the new spaces is, they have to be spaces where we are giving ourselves and each other a chance to really understand what our lives actually mean, not just through our own, frames, right? Not just through our own glasses, whatever we're wearing. And how do we disembed ourselves from our own embeddedness in our settings, in our cultures, in our languages, you know, all those things so that we can see ourselves from other people's perspectives. And at the same time, both not be completely taken over, washed over by others' experiences. But again, it's a both end. How do we take in what other people are seeing and how do we you know, um, filter the things that are useful in a particular moment? May not be now, but 10 years later, you remember, oh, I had that conversation and that's what they were talking about. I, I think one of the important things that I really like about myself that I'm coming to recognize, and this I'm not trying to sound like arrogant or anything. I love the fact that I'm curious. I really wanna understand, right? I wanna understand who you are, who you are, what's happening in the wider world that's beyond just plain old explanations. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm not taken in by words and jargon. I wanna know what you mean by them. When you say BIPOC, what are you talking about, right? If you talk about intersectionality, what are you talking about? All these words we learn in college, to me, they're meaningless unless you can really talk about what those concepts mean to you and be able to explain them to people who have not had formal education in women and gender studies, Africana studies or whatever right, that you can talk to, quote, your grandmother, as it were, this came up uh, earlier uh, today, 
right? So I think reflexivity and curiosity are really important. And today, every day I learned something, something new that I didn't understand before. And I know that's the, one of the things that I'm so joyful about and makes me excited about being alive. You know, I learn something every single day, even if it's something, you know, mundane, like something about a technology thing. Like I learned, you know, a new little software yesterday, trying to do my radio program. You know what I mean? It's so it could be as mundane as that, or, you know, listening to somebody say, you know, I want to talk I want to be able to talk to my grandmother about these things. And I don't think she, she can understand. And I said to her, what don't you think she understands? Like, what do you want her to understand that she doesn't understand or you think she doesn't? And how can you actually learn what she understands and what she knows through just her own quote lived experience, right? Um, yeah, I'm kind of going off, but you know, all right, thank you so much. This has been so generative and I really appreciate your perspectives. Um, I was also really struck by how you were talking about love as a methodology. Oh yes, love as a methodology. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like the role of utopia um, through all of these like climatological or ecological epidemiological degradations that are happening. Like what is the role of utopia in getting us to organize and um, to think really critically about how we convene. Yeah, I don't think about the role of utop utopia. I think about the role of imagination and creativity. You know, for me, as a, as a friend, you know, has said before, is the opposite of war isn't peace. It's really creativity, right? And I think imagination and creativity have to be part of our methodology, right? And that we come up with methodologies that embody the certain, the very specific values that we want to have as part of a utopia. I don't start with a utopia, right? But let's start really, and we, we do think about what we're trying to create. So, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, as somebody said, right? So we do have to think about what we're trying to create, right? But to do that, we have to really, you know how we all go to the gym or we do something physical, we're trying to get in physical shape and all that. Um, I think we need to get in shape our imagination, right? Our spiritual selves, right? So that we become much more whole. And so it's not utopia for me. It is really about imagination and creativity, right? And that those we develop in community. And community isn't something that's already there. We have to create it, right? Um, and for me, that is all about love, right? Imagining, being creative, um, bringing people together, building relationships so that we can imagine possibilities. You know, just I'll just give one, you know, the hardest paper for, for my students to write ever in my 30 years of teaching was a paper about the future. Like what, you know, what are you imagining as a genuinely secure community or something? They could write all kinds of beautiful analyses, this and that, but that was the hardest one and they said it, right? We can't imagine it. We can't imagine what, a non-capitalist, you know, place would look like or something like that. So imagination, and I think if you all are professors here or any teachers of any kind, don't overteach criticism. <laughs> let's let's teach how to imagine and, and to create. Yeah, yeah um, thank you so much for being here. And I really appreciate you discussing the dynamic between privilege and power. Um, the question I had is in regards to language, and I know with you having these intersecting identities, I was actually talking to my housemate about this last night. Um, I feel like in regards to like the Spanish language and these intersecting identities, it allows me to communicate better with my parents, but at the same time, not speaking like Spanish fluently all the way also makes me feel like 
that I don't connect with them fully. So it's like, how do you view these experiences of like the intersecting identity of like language, if that makes sense? <laughs> because I, I have trouble sometimes because like, I think language is beautiful and it's very helpful, but at the same time, it's like the fact that I can't fully connect or like speak fluently. And when I'm like in Colombia, South America, I don't feel like a true identified Colombian because of the Americanization of my identity. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, I've actually been thinking about this question a lot throughout my life. And where did we get the idea that there is a one true identity of any peoples? Like, where does that come from? Right? Is that kind of like a colonized mind thinking, right? That there's this essentialist way that if you are X, Y, if you're X group, you have to have X, Y, Z characteristics, right? Where did that come from? And what, first of all, was that ever real, right? And for sure, for people like you and me, that's not real now, right? And for many people. So I would ask you to think about if you, if you had the perfect Spanish that you imagine in the Colombian context, the Colombian Spanish, right? What would that do for you? What yearning would that satisfy in you? Right. No, I'm not, I'm not asking you to, to answer it, but do you know what I mean? Like sometimes, I think sometimes we get stuck on the top layers of things. And I've been trying to get deeper into understanding the meanings and significance of things, right? concepts, terms, um, and because that's how I want to connect with people. I don't want to just connect on a category level or, you know, I can speak this language and, you know, and those things are important. And I'll just tell you something that's been a very profound experience for me. So I spend a lot of time in Palestine. I love it there. I love the people. I hardly speak any Arabic, right? It's one of the places where I, I experience being most recognized who I am on the inside and most appreciated. No language, very little language, right? Some English gets spoken, but it's something deeper, right? And so how do we honor all the layers of connections, you know, in such a way that we're not dismissing anything but seeing how those layers are connected to each other, how is language connected to recognition? How are those things connected to our own yearnings about what we want and need as somebody who's in the diaspora, for example, right? And it's interesting, um, I had this conversation with uh, Professor Jordan yesterday, you know, about appropriation, how um, let's say we, um, uh, African-Americans get upset if some white people take a music and call it theirs, right? And then, but we feel fine about wearing African, you know, traditional dress. We don't think about that as appropriation, not because we're Africans. Do you know what I mean? Like these essentialist ways just are not working, right? So, so assuming that what I'm saying is close to, you know, correct, then on what basis must we think about connections to one another? On what basis do we create the solidarities we need to create to create the kinds of changes we want? On what basis do we connect so that we can become more fully human, right, beyond the categories? While at the same time, recognizing the connections of those categories to structures of power. I'm not saying throw out all the structural stuff because I am a dyed in the wool structuralist for sure, right? And I'm much more than that. You know, I'm thinking about things in much more complicated ways than that. So I don't know if I'm rambling, but. Well, we have another question um, from the uh, interwebs. Uh, do you think it's possible to reach a goal, a, to reach a global common ground in regards to empathy? 
I'm not sure what that means. What, what, what are you asking? I think, can we reach a, a global common ground, I think? So is, are, are there base, you know, things across the world that we could all agree on? I think one of the things that maybe you've gestured towards is like, we want everybody to thrive, but is that a global value perhaps? So the, the person's asking, you know, do you think we can reach global common ground? Add something to it. Give you, give you, I don't think it's the best example. I don't know if any, many of you all have been following this, but there's this kind of thing that they were doing called playing for change. You, you saw that where somebody in uh, Cuba starts Guantanamera and then it goes, you see what I'm saying? Yes, so the, the music, music plays yeah. that role mm -hmm. in, in that particular situation of connecting people at a level of, of experience, of sense, and not necessarily of, of talking. So mm -hmm. maybe the same thing with empathy. Is there a way that people connect outside of the physical? And I think that's what they're speaking of. So if you're, mm -hmm. if you're saying that when you go to Palestine, that you are most recognized for who you are, it's not being recognized for how you describe yourself, it's for what you, what, what you, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, th I think, you know what I'm, saying? Yeah. I'm not sure this answers the question. But I'm coming to think that there are universals, right, around things like empathy, for example. At the same time, because I think if we're human, and I know we've been dehumanized, but I think one of the human impulses is to be empathetic, right? And one of the questions for me has been, you know, right now, especially we see how the politics of fear have brought out the worst parts of us in so many of us, right? So what kinds of structures and institutions so forth would bring out the best in us? But to get there, we have to really think about how do we connect, whether it's in small groups, you know, Bandana Shiva talks about this in a really wonderful way, she says, you know, we have to re-regionalize. So we have to think globally about certain forces that are operating, but we also have to think really in very specific ways where we are so that we can get clear about what, what our values are and then think about how to connect those. And there are global um, movements, global networks of people who are talking about the same kinds of things and um, uh, our values. And I love our network called the International Women's Network Against Militarism. This is our 25th year. We're not an organization, we're a very loose network. But whenever we come together to have a face-to-face -face meeting, which is not every year or anything, it never was, it certainly hasn't been lately, we sit together and talk about what's happening in our respective communities around the US military bases. Right, and we talk about what matters to us. A similar principle just, you know, emerge from our conversations. And I'll send you all the our network statement um, uh, on what we think about as genuine security. We need to have places where we can talk together, and it can be it can be Zoom now, right? For example, um, where we can discover what are the principles that matter to us and. What are the commonalities? What are those ones shared? And I think sometimes we get stuck because a group A wants a very concrete specific thing and group B wants con another concrete thing that's very different from A, right? But if we go to the underneath and say, so what, if you had those, what would you have, right? Then we could discover in a really meaningful way, why those things matter, because they're the things that we're seeking, right? But they're also the, the underlying deep parts of those that give us, let's say, a sense of agency, or that says we are worthwhile, right? Do you know what I'm saying? Does this sound like a little bit crazy? <laughs> but anyway, 
you get the idea, right? How do we engage in such a way that we don't just stay at the top layers, but can go into how we construct our meanings, how we, um, the values that guide the decisions we make, you know, like that. So can I just give an example? If we, I don't know if we have time. Yeah. So I was thinking right after the elections of you know who, um, I was curious. I was curious about why all those white women voted for them. Um, why, you know, this group voted for some other candidate, why some people didn't vote at all. And I didn't want to know just the why of it, but what were the deepest yearnings they thought would be met by voting for whatever candidate, right? So it wasn't even about the candidates. So I had this idea of having like um, uh, conversations all over the country, you know, to talk about what are your deepest yearnings, right? What are your deepest yearnings that motivate you um, to do the kinds of things you do, make the decisions, you know, choose the people, whatever, right? And that's a different question than saying, why did you vote for X, right? And I want us, and this is my curiosity, is I want to understand, not just know stuff. I mean, I can just go on YouTube and learn a million things, but I really want to understand who people are, right? In this particular moment, and what would bring folks joy? What would, you know, give folks, you know, whatever they're seeking that's deeper, right? So a parent could say, you know, I want to make sure that my children, you know, get good education. If you had that, what would that mean to you? As a parent, as an adult, whatever, right? Does this make sense? It does. I, I have a question that I think follows that. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your wisdom and for what you're just speaking into this space. Um, and I was, um, after the last question about global empathy, I was reminded of what you said when I first came in um, about the, the necessity of having, um, making a commitment and having values. And you just spoke to that, so I'm, I appreciate that. So my question is um, what recommendations do you have for doing the work that you just described? So where would be the opportunity to talk to the women who would, where you would pose that really provocative question, what deep journey um, would, you know, are you going? I can't do it as eloquently as you said it, but where, where do we stage those places? It seems to me that's the work of the kind of transformative um, justice that you're talking about. Um, and to get us to um, start to imagine. And, and if I may, I wanna share an example that I just had recently because I'm always seeking those spaces. And I was with a group of um, activist friends. We were planning some um, more spaces to connect with, with more activists to do um, this work. And we have a check-in. And one of the people who checked in said this, a year ago, my mother was killed in an accident and she was killed by a young man who had stolen a car and ran through an intersection. And then she said this, she said, I am walking through my grief and through the systems. And she said it in a way where she talked about holding both of those things because she was committed to restorative justice. So that's the kind of deep journey that I'm looking for, that I'm seeking, because we can talk and we get it. We know we want joy, we have imagination, but when it, can we live those commitments? I think that's what it takes. And I think it starts at the level of the small group, which is where you've, you've been talking. So that's my question to you. <laughs> Thank well, you. I want everybody 
just talk to your neighbor. What do you think about that? How, how can you imagine doing that? I want you all to talk to each other because this is like horizontal. You know what I mean? It's just bi-directional or uni. So just spend a couple of minutes. You know, how do you imagine doing what um, the person just asked? You've done it. Oh, no. I'm just trying to have fun. I love life. I love people. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll, um, I'll, 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 I'm a professor here. You're the Kansas. second Pat Parker. Yes, I am. You I wish I was so listen, if I, were I wish you could have met her. <laughs> if I were as fierce as that Pat Parker, you would say wouldn't it. have a chance. <laughs> it doesn't. Have it doesn't have a chance now. <laughs> I want to. I want to look into that legacy of that Pat Parker for sure. She was fierce. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. She was. Um, but anyway, I, I'm here on this campus. I am a professor of communication studies. Okay. And I'm currently the director of the Institute. Martha just wanted to take my picture. So I want to. I'm the director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities. Just uh, got that appointment. <laughs> oh, good. All of us. Action. Oh, action shot, not a pose I shot. See, okay, I we got to so. be talking. Anyway, so yeah, I, yeah. So I am. I'm the director of the Institute. And um, anyway, I'm just so glad that you're on campus. Thank and you. Thank you're, you. We need your wisdom right now. We just, we need it. And uh, uh, that sounds weird to me, you does know. Does it really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want you to, I want you to like, uh, listen, wisdom comes from having, uh, I mean, you were, you were with the founder, some of the founding mothers of this current moment. In terms of being involved in that conversation with feminism, I mean, even though it's not that long ago, it seems ages ago because you know, and that was that was connected to so many. Do I really have to tell you? <laughs> no, I don't. I just don't think about it like that. You know, I'm just like loving my life and feeling grateful. I, I wrote a book about Ella Baker, mm -hmm. and when Miss Baker found me, because that's what Barbara Ransky said mm -hmm. about when she. And my book was about my experience of trying to live her, you know, it's sort of passing on this lived experience, this tradition. I think it's a tradition of organizing that, especially as, as women of color, as black, as black women, that, oh, you're such a wonderful person, is. seriously. Marcus was, um, of business, the administrative associate at my department when I was. Really. And I've been working on. Uh, and he probably never even imagined that I'd become chair of that department at the at, 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 We were all in the Okay. Anyway, I'm going to go. I just wanted to meet you. And okay. I'm glad. Okay. You know the IH is one of those uh, No, yes, not necessarily. You know, it's just the moment for them to be oh, together. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. To be continued. Yes, to be continued, Pat Parker. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, I. The spaces you all have here are places to have these conversations. They want me to play the song. I don't know what? which one it is. Which song is it? Okay, no. Which one is it? It's that one. No, no, no. It's the song, We Are Rising. Oh, yeah. That's... Which one is it? That's it. That's the I album. Thought... No, that's, that's like just one song, isn't it? No. Well, the rising, song is called. We are rising. We are. Rising. Which one is it? That one's three minutes, so it's that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just that okay. Oh man. Okay. I hope you had a good time coming up with your deeper yearnings. Nothing. But we have two more questions that we'd like to get to. One is online and one's here in person. So let me just 
uh, read the one that's online. Um, talking about politics and institution, most recently the conflict between Ukraine and Russia seems to have brought a greater number of people together because they empathize with Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Do you think it takes a conflict at that level for people to come together since it's also our human instinct to be competitive and create conflicts rather than maintaining peace? First of all, I disagree that it's our human in instinct to create conflict. I think we can go either way, right? And I think certain, like I said before, certain um, leaders, certain forces encourage us to be one way or the, or the other. I think it's a mistake to say instinctually we create conflicts. So I just wanna disagree with that part. Um, and I think, you know, there's a way in which, and we see this from Black Lives Matter movement, you know, we see these from uh, these other crises, right? People jump out for the crises. But what we have difficulty doing is maintaining something over time which is putting one foot in front of the other, going through the hard stuff, going through the quote boring stuff of whatever we have to do to keep things going, right? It's easy to jump out when there's a conflict, but those folks who jumped out for Black Lives Matter, those who jumped out for Ukraine and um, the war um, in, in Ukraine right now, where are you gonna be next week when it's not the headlines, right? We keep, and, and that would be a good question, right? What, what happens to you when you go out? What's the yearning, right? That draws you to jumping into a conflict, but then you disappear, right? What would it take for us to, to maintain the long haul of challenging militarism, for example, or you know, really rethinking what security is and all that? Right, and how does an emphasis on individualism and um, what I think about as a McDonald's mentality, you just drive up, order your food, get it, eat it in the car and you're on to the next thing, right? That McDonald's mentality is gonna kill us. It's gonna kill the planet, right? So how must we think about, How can we have a politics that really is generative and that is longer term and also responding to certain crises? You know, something that my friend, Sir, Professor Circes Mendez, who does amazing work on transformative justice, says is that by the time a crisis happens, it's too late, right? You have to send, you have to put things in place. For example, in the case of transformative justice, you have to be building community so that when the violation happens, the community will be there to hold both the perpetrator, you know, and the survivor. You can't put transformative justice, it's not just a method, right? So how, what do we need to create? Because we know things are gonna keep happening like what's happening now, but what do we need to be putting in place so that we're not just always reacting, <coughs> right? Or we're not just operating out of a crisis mentality and not really exercising our imagination that we're building sturdy bridges among ourselves. You know, I don't care about your category, right? What I care about is like, who are you really? And what are you really about, right? Because there are people who look like me, I wouldn't trust them you know, because they're not trustworthy, right? They haven't shown themselves to be dependable or whatever, right? It doesn't mean I'm gonna throw them out, but I'm gonna be careful, right? Somebody who doesn't look like me, who's been just an amazing ally, person, support, right? So no easy answers, right? How do we make the connections we need to make to hold movements, to, to sustain this work over, over time. And in a sense, this is gonna sound really cheesy as my students would say, you know, how do we become what we're trying to create? Right? How do we become that? Not just perform it, right? How does it become our skin, 
you know, our, our cells, you know, so that, so that we can live it. What do you all think? I mean, what came up, you know, and I said I wasn't going to do this, but maybe <laughs> some, just a couple of things that came up in your conversation. I do have two more questions, yeah. but maybe we could take two or three people who yeah. want to share what they did in their. their Thank school. you for keeping me in check. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> Perfect. Any, any insights you want to share and really keep it concise because they're, you know, we don't want one person just hogging up the whole space, but anything you want to share insights? It's okay if you don't, just in case anybody does. Or maybe we'll take a question and come back to that okay. and distill your thought. Um, I appreciate you being here again and sharing your wisdom, but um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about, you've mentioned a couple of times how like studying this and being a feminist and all of this <laughs> um, has made you excited to be alive. And I think it's really admirable that you keep saying that because grappling with these difficult and heavy topics can be disheartening sometimes and like make you not excited to be alive. So I wish, uh, or I hope if, I don't know, if you could share your wisdom on how you take these hard subjects of discrimination and oppression and um, aspects of identity and use them to make you excited to be alive or like how, how working with them make you excited. I'm excited <laughs> to be alive because I love people. You know, it's not about me per se, but that every encounter I have, whether it's at the grocery store or something, there's something I learn about somebody every single day, you know, or um, why wouldn't a person like me with, you know, everything I have in material terms or emotional terms, spiritual terms, why wouldn't I be happy? You know, why wouldn't I be joyful? Why wouldn't I be grateful? Right? And I think what's been ironic about this pandemic is some of the most grumpy people, the ones who are the most afraid have been people of great privilege and being so nervous that whatever they have, they're gonna lose it or something, right? And Yeah, I don't know how else to, to answer. I wasn't always like this, I have to say. I was grumpy and, you know, just being reactionary like a lot of us were and just, um, but I think it's also being in places like Palestine and South Korea and Okinawa, certain countries in West Africa and seeing that despite all these diff difficult circumstances, people find joy and meaning right? Life goes on. People get married, they have children, you know, they lose people. Life goes on, right? And life is going to go on with or without us. And I want to be part of going on with other folks, right? Um, and as I'm talking, I'm thinking, wow, you sound really like zzz. <laughs> but I actually really believe it, what I'm saying. So can you maybe... Take us through a little bit of that arc from when you were grumpy to now, because I think part of what I heard in your question is that we're all really tender right now with all that's going on in the world. We all feel vulnerable and uncertain. And it's how do we get to the other side or how do we live through uncertainty perhaps is another way to think about it. You know something, um, this is something I just, I had a realization about just recently, you know how in popular psychology, we're told, you know, you can't, you can't love other people until you love yourself. Everybody's heard that, right? I think it's actually the other way around. I hmm. think I've come to love myself the more I've loved other people and really tried to see other people, right? And that creates a kind of a circuit that flows. And, um, And all the people, you know, who have loved me so that I could become who I am, right? And being grateful, you know, for that. And I think gratitude is a really important part. I wake up every morning 
just so happy to be alive. And anybody who knows me, right, will tell you that I'm not just saying that because I'm at this talk. Um, and so how do we, it's a both and moment, right? Things are horrible, you know, and for different people, they're really unbearable, but they're bearing up under it, right? And that it's also a time where being joyful and having fun and all that are radical acts, right? It's a time, I think, where the challenge of, you know, um, making connections across language and difference and all that stuff is really important, but we can't keep using the same tools because they don't work right now in this moment, right? Um, and so how do we think about what kinds of methodologies? How do we you know, need to be together? And I was thinking um, earlier to an earlier question, these kinds of spaces are absolutely important. There was a professor at Mount Holyoke who was a professor of Barbara Smith. Her name was Professor Jean Grossold. She was a political science professor. And the thing that she kept, and she was a great friend of the Kambahi. We used her house for um, retreats and stuff early on. One thing she kept talking about was the, the critical importance of creating free spaces like these, where we can have conversations, where we can come to know each other, not so much because right now it's kind of bilateral, but you know, where we could talk in smaller groups or, and I think that's one of the responsibilities for those of you all, and you all have been doing this. Heidi, my old friend, Joseph, you know, you know all of you who are here, creating these spaces where we can have these kinds of conversations so that we can eventually come to know ourselves and each other, you know, that's beyond categories, right? And we can see each other's humanities, recognize our own humanity, you know, and to say, even if I don't agree with you, and this sounds really corny as well, right? I love you. I love the space we're creating together because we can grow from it. It's not flawless. It's not without contradictions, right? Um, but we do it because all our lives depend on it and the lives of the future generations. And just one other thing I think is important too is my friend, uh, Patricia St. Ange, who's an indigenous um, uh, leader in, um, in Oakland, right? Talks about, we live in a society that makes us forget, right? We forget our history. We forget what happened yesterday. We forget that wars have happened before. Do you know what I mean? That one of our jobs right now, people who are alive right now is to remember, right? To remember what our ancestors brought, to remember traditional cultures, whatever your tradition is, right? If you think about it, people who came to the US or were brought to the US who were here, other people encroached on them, were all really told to forget what happened. Forget where you came from so you can be white, right? Forget that you're Irish because it's important for you to be white. Forget that you came from a particular part of Africa that you were brought here forcibly, right? Just get on with it, right? So what are the things we must Remember, that's not just remembering trauma, but remembering the parts of our cultures and our ancestors, the power, their power, right? Remembering the things that made them who they are, that makes us who we are, whether we recognize it or not, right? How do we remember the life-giving forces, you know, that all of our people have had? We had, doesn't matter what you look like now, right? And so how do we remember those things that really are about life and um, connection, right? Not just to us, us as human beings, but to the natural world, which is what um, my friend Patricia, you know, always talks about all our relations. How do we 
really get it that we all are related? How do we internalize it and how do we act out of that? I think it's really important. My question is like, we've been talking a lot about empathy and the McDonald's mindset. I find a lot in my own personal life and also among other people is that I find among a lot of well-meaning people, the problem is not a lack of empathy, but like paralysis by all the things that one feels empathy for. So because of like social media and because of the 24 hour news cycle, I feel as though like we're inundated with so many things for which we empath like feel empathy, but because there are so many going on, you just sort of shut down. And it is obviously from a position of privilege that you can just block that out and not really deal with it. Um, but my question is like, how do we more sustainably empathize with people in Palestine, you know, where, yeah, the news has moved on to some other catastrophic event. How do we continue work to support communities around the world and here in the US without overtaxing our own abilities in those, in those moments? My friend Martha Matsuoka uh, taught me a new concept about a couple of weeks ago which is this idea of translocal, right? So that, and I think it's really um, promoted in the context of en the environmental justice movement, but how do you work locally understanding that there's a whole transnational part of it, right? And that we don't need to necessarily be going to Palestine, working on Palestinian people's issue, for example, right? But understanding what are the forces at work here, right? That are operating there and how do we deal with those forces rather than, you know, um, putting out that fire that is Palestine, right? Or putting out a fire that's here. We, the fire needs to be put out. There's no question, but the longer term, how do we do that over time? The other thing is turn off that news, <laughs> shut it off. You know, we become such junkies, you know, like we got to know what the latest news is. And now there's a way that you can just really selectively listen to the news, right? Um, in my generation and your generation, really different material circumstances, right? I, you know, came of age in a generation where the economy was much more expansive because of the Vietnam War, <laughs> not surprisingly, right? You're in a, in, a, in a very different, you know, neoliberal, hyper-capitalist kind of moment. So the opportunities are really different. Having said that, though, each, as Franz Fanon says, each generation, you have to decide your mission right? You have to decide your mission and you have to think together about how to do that. You know, I can't tell you from my perspective, I can say well, these are the things that we did, but it was really different, right? And think for yourselves, how do you deal with disappointments, right? How do you deal with the rage, right? As well as really think about you know, the, the joyful part, what brings you joy? And it could be little things, right? And it is often the little things that are some of the most profound experiences of joy that I've had, right? But you have to figure it out. It's not there, you know, necessarily. And it may not look like what you think it should be. That's the other thing. We have certain expectations, right? If person looks like this, then I can expect that from them then a lot of times we're disappointed. You know, if we have you no know, black woman in the Supreme Court, or if we have a white woman in the Supreme Court or black man, you know, it's gonna be different. Well, well, <laughs> right? Yeah, you have to create it. That's it. I would say detach from all the bad news right? and, and be selective. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention the Stone Center is also hosting a lecture. 
Uh, thank, first, thank you to everyone. Um, what we didn't do in the beginning is we didn't say that this was a collaborative project. Uh, Carolina Seminars, the Stone Center, Asian American Center, the Alliance. Yeah, that's a big deal. It's a big, very big deal. The support of, of women and gender studies. Uh, so we're happy to continue and to begin anew with that kind of collaboration. We also have a diaspora lecture tomorrow with Jennifer Jones, and her topic is from Jim Crow to Juan Crow. So she's looking at uh, the browning of the New South, looking at Latinx, Afro Latinx migration. Uh, to the New South. So you're, yeah, here we go with Zoom again. You'll be able to listen, <laughs> look at that on Zoom as well. And uh, I think, Margo, you talk about what's going to be the mark of this generation. It's got, you know, it's going to be the Zoom generation. I think that's exactly how we're going to be remembered. But thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate it. Take food home with you. That's the way you show love. <laughs> and, yes. And we got one more thing. Uh oh. Yeah, we got one more thing. Everybody oh, jump. Yeah, wait, wait. yeah, we weren't okay. going to forget that. Okay, good. Uh, Margo has specifically said, in, in terms of cultivating joy, we're going to dance out of here. <laughs> so there is a specific we're song trying. that she has chosen that we are going to sashay our way, you know, twerk our way out of as you collect more food. Yeah. Do you want to say, so let me give you the final word before we. we yeah, we're not going to sashay out of here. I want you all to say at least for a little bit of the song so we can dance together. You can do it socially distanced, wear your masks, and then sashay. Okay. All right, you gotta dance first. Okay. Okay. That's the okay. price of admission. Okay. All right. Thank you, well, let's thank, let's thank our guests too. All right, hit it. Where's the DJ? <laughs> You're with me today. <laughs> Play that song. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. I'm going to let it play the cat. Okay. I meant to. Hey, let's, let's hear the music. Come on, Sharif. Sure. I have a question for you. Oh, wow. uh, um, to get the, the link or whatnot onto this uh, radio show. Okay. So, how would I? How would I get? Uh, let me see. That? I can tell you. My friend and I that are here from Dr. Shields' class are both DJs. And we were really excited to hear. Hello. You're DJs. Hi. Hi. Yeah. The the radio is a talk show. The Wednesday night dance party. Oh no, that's Thursday dance oh, party. Oh, sorry, Thursday night dance party. Oh, you want the link for that? Yeah. That, okay, just. And also, you're doing a talk show too. Yeah, I have a talk show. I'm loving everything you have to say. So if there's more, okay, let me see.
play it through the computer, Joseph? No. I need to see online as I get on Google security makes it easy and fast to make sure that I'm safe and safe. Make sure that I'm safe and safe. By visiting .co. Oh, I love that.